Hebrews 10, 29. If how much sore punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that Brother Jonathan will have strength to stand. In just name, amen. Brother, I'll confess to you I am weary and having difficulty, but you'll find that prayer is going to make me stand. <laughs> that was a very fitting prayer. Our God makes men stand, so that's who we go to. Well, as you can see, this isn't the kind of passage you read with a smile. In fact, the content portrays a very sad image in the mind of those that read it. But even though this passage may not be the most pleasant of texts, I refuse to treat it as a passage that we're in no need of observing. I mean, are we, are we above the need for warning? As faithful as we are, as well as we advance, are we above that need for warning? Is this for, just for the backslidden? That's, there's no room for us to, have, to give ear to these words? Let's think about that. I mean, are we not capable of falling into this dreaded state? Is that not what we're told about this? Because the capacity is there if we don't take heed to the words of, of Christ and the apostles? You see, there's a saying where people will taunt, like it's about for a fight. They'll say, like, you want a piece of me? Well, I guarantee Jay, uh, Satan, he doesn't want a piece of the church. He's not content with a handful. He wants to bring the entire thing down. Satan's not just targeting a couple of us. He wants all of us alienated from God. Say, Satan would love it if this passage was a description of all of us. He'd love to hear, he'd love to, for Brother Jonathan to be the man who trod underfoot the Son of God. That's what he's aiming to do. He's trying to get people into this state. Jesus talked about false Christs. They're going to rise up. They're going to deceive many, if it were possible, even the elect. Now, Satan's trying to prove that wrong. Satan's trying to good fault with God. Well, I'm, he, that's who he's going to target. He's going to target the people God has determined to keep. But we're all standing today, are we not? Are we going to be like the church at Laodicea who feels that they, they don't need anything? I am in need of nothing. Surely not. I'm sure that you agree that we should not treat anything God says like it's unimportant or that we don't need it. Amen? I do intend to be very straightforward in the message today. I'm not going to pull any punches in this. I'm not going to water it down. As Brother Bob said, no fluffing stuff. This isn't the place for that. I'm not, sp I, but at the same time though, I do want the saints to be edified, right? You want the saints to be encouraged and built up and more, more equipped to fight the good fight of faith after you preach the gospel to them. You don't want to rob people of that when you speak. Amen. So I am mindful I'm not speaking to rebels and backsliders and deviants. I'm mindful of who I'm speaking to right now. But then again, you'll find that words like the ones you, we just heard read to us, they can protect you. They really can. Remember that passages like this are not only preached when a person is backslidden, but they're also preached to the faithful in order to prevent backsliding. Amen. Now the language in this passage is quite strong that young Hannah read to us. You'll find there is a clear message in the text, as well as others like it. The message is Jesus is the only means to be saved. The only means to be saved. I mean, this is a clear message in Scripture, isn't it? Jesus is the only means to be saved. If you don't have Jesus, you got nothing. That's a clear message in Scripture, clear, crystal clear. Now, men may philosophize about this, but I encourage you, believe the words of Christ. When he says, if any man come to me, that's where salvation is. There is no other source. Like, Jesus didn't have a list of exceptions when he talked about salvation in him, did he? If any man come to me, except if he be, no. Any man, that's all men. All men have to come to Jesus, and they can with that being said, I sarcastically 
and bluntly address the following stage. Because people like to philosophize about this. Men would love to find a way around Jesus to be accepted. But this is not true. Like people say, like, well, surely God won't condemn those unbelievers. They might point out to a particular person, they're such good people. They've done so much good for the world. God won't condemn them, will he? They'll ask you questions like that. You don't have Jesus? You got nothing. That's my response. Well, would a loving God just damn such a nice and caring person, you know? You don't have Jesus? You got nothing. Or perhaps one of the more common ones. What about that poor, innocent little islander out there in the middle of the ocean, stranded, who's never heard the gospel? Will God condemn him? You don't have Jesus? You got nothing. That's what we have in the scriptures. Let's not ever entertain any idea that there's a way around Jesus that we could be saved apart from Jesus, ever. Jesus is the one source by which men are saved. That's our message. Jesus, Jesus, Amen. that's who we'll direct someone to. We'll never direct them anywhere else, but Jesus Christ. You see, this isn't something unclear in regards to salvation. I mean, have you ever read in the gospel accounts, Jesus saying, if any man go to him, you ever read Jesus say that? Or Jesus say, come to that man over there. No. When it comes to having everlasting life, when it comes to rest when heavy laden, when it comes to drinking living water, and when it comes to never hungry, never thirsting, Jesus says, come to me. Amen. And we found it is in him, haven't we? No one has found that word untrue here. The Father said he draws men. God draws men. But where does he draw them? Jesus spoke on this matter too. No man comes to me unless the Father first draw him. So are, are men being drawn? Are they being directed? This is where they're going. If God's drawing a man, this is where they're going to end up. They're going to end up with Jesus. They say like, well, all paths lead to the same area. Well, all God's drawings lead to the same area. All men who are drawn by God, they all end up at the same place. In Jesus Christ. I'm glad God's brought us to Jesus. Here are some more just straightforward expressions in the scripture. He that believeth on him is not condemned, right? Amen? Amen. He that believeth not is condemned already. Because, he tells you why. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's a straightforward expression. There's no wiggle room in there. Straightforward. He also says this is, this is in John the third chapter. I just read verse 18. It's 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Hath. Present tense. Amen? Present tense. Hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him. That also is present tense. Abideth, not shall, not will in the future, abides now. So there's no question about any of this. Acts 4.12 clearly declares this. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men where why we must be saved. Amen? Do you believe this? I believe that. Amen, yes. God has provided one way for men to be saved, and that one way is more than capable of accomplishing salvation. More than capable. We don't need a second Savior. Are we going to entertain the notion that Jesus isn't enough? Are we ever? Well, we have a wicked one who would love us to do that, but in your right mind, in your soul, now that your pure minds have been stirred up, I ask you this question. Is Jesus not enough? Is somehow Jesus going to come up short-handed? Is anyone going to dare say that, uh, entertain this? Like, Jesus didn't die for nothing. The death of Jesus was not vain. Jesus didn't get nailed to the cross for just a handful of people. You see, they get in this tie about numbers. How many are going to hell? How many are going to heaven? I guarantee heaven's going to win by a blowout. Blowout! If you're condemned, you're in a small group in the end. That shows the humiliation that comes with condemnation. Jesus wasn't abandoned by God momentarily on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just so men can go back to normal routines. 
And let's just think of that. What exactly did Jesus' death accomplish? And we're talking about sanctification, the setting apart, people not like anyone else. In what sense are we not like anyone else? Did Jesus die for people who have a different hairstyle? Well, if it comes to hair, I don't have much hope, but is that what Jesus came to produce? That? Outward? Just outward alone. Or maybe people who just dress different, like under the law. Is that what Jesus died? Jesus died for that? For us to be different only by dress code, maybe? Or perhaps Jesus died, did Jesus die to produce a people that simply just eats different fruit than what everyone eats? They know, our, they know we're Christians by our lunch menu? No. Absolutely not. That is not what sanctification does. Sanctification is inward, inside, inside. Jesus died to produce a sanctified people. And then now we're there. He is the means of sanctification. This change that we're talking about, this setting apart, that's where it is started. That's where it's continued. It's in Jesus. We're not talking about something that happens outside of Christ. It's in Christ. Sanctification takes place. No one outside of Christ is sanctified. Nobody. You can't get this experience anywhere else. Now, on this note of what is sanctification, I already knew that just about every minister is going to get up here and give some kind of word on this, right? And you've, you've heard quite a variation of meanings to this word, and it's not very repetitive either. We're not, like, copying each other here. I, I picked up on that, and even though a lot's been said, I'm not, that's not going to stop me from expounding it anyway, because... I'll tell you what I mean. You want to break out of this mindset like, well, this has been said many times already, but I'm just going to say it anyway because I wrote it down in my notes, right? I wrote it down in my notes. I mean, I already took the time to type it out, make it all nice and pretty on paper, and I, I have to say it now because I wrote it down. It's been said already, but I wrote it down, so I'm going to say it again, right? You want to break out of that mindset. Rather, I've noticed the brethren, they're building on what the previous brother said. Like, they, they lay like, sanctification is this. And it's like we're saying, and it's this, and then the other one says, and it's this, and the other one says, and it's this. You see, they're building on, that's good. That's good. I want to add, uh, that's provoked me as I've heard you all speak. I want to add to that. I want us to be able to have like a real vast meaning here given. Not, si not simply just for the sake of just not repeating. This is what the body of Christ does. It works together, right? Amen. It works together. So we're going to work together as we clarify what this is. Sanctification, yeah, we've brought out this, the setting apart from the rest of the world. I mean, we're not set apart by name only. I trust you believe that. We're not just, this isn't just a name. I mean, if, if we are, if that's all we're separated by. If we're, if we're just separate by name, then what we're doing is just a big joke. I mean, that's the truth. If, you, if, you, if a name is all that separates you from the rest of the world, I mean, your religion is a sham. It's a hoax. It's a bunch of garbage. The people of God are different and the way they live, they live different. They behave different. They think different. Their mindset is different. Nature, the nature of the people of God are different than the rest of the world. Now, when you come into Christ, it's true. You become a new creature. You become a different person. It's an evident change, too. We're not, new creature isn't slight change. It's, it is a complete turnaround in what you were before. Praise God. Now, have people concluded that you're a follower of Christ just by seeing your pure conduct? I'm sure many of us can testify to this. You have sanctification to thank for that. I mean, do people even know? It's like, you're not like other people. There's something different. That's, see, that's sanctification. That's at work, evidenced outwardly. This isn't just, I don't have to convince you you're sanctified. I'm seeing it in you. I'm seeing it. Is your life so much different than your past life? Is Praise God for your testimony, Brother Mike. That was precious. Is it so different from your, from, your, from your past sinful life that if you do sin, if, it looks grossly out of character? How about that? Even, I mean, I'm not talking like just in the body of Christ. I'm talking about in the world. People will sense sin, if expressed, strange. Like, that's not how he normally acts. See, well, praise God for sanctification because that's the work there. That's what that's produced. Mind you, this isn't simply, as we have stated, just not being set apart just for the sake of being different alone. It's being set apart for holy use, which what God uses is a holy use, right? The people who are set apart by God, they're going to be contributors to what he's doing. Amen? A contributor, a fellow laborer, working for God. 
to bring about what he's purposed to bring to pass. Praise the Lord. I, I thank God for that kind of participation. Amen. What a thing to be invited into, a thing to be able to be part of. Praise the Lord. But then again, sanctification, as you may know, it's not just self-discipline, right? I mean, I'm sanctified because I've been cleansed, right? I'm purified. I'm made holy. You see, I didn't generate that in myself. I didn't generate holiness in my own being. I didn't generate purity. I wasn't those things by nature before in my past life. I mean, well, the scriptures tell us what we used to be. I used to walk according to the course of this world. That's what you were. You used to live for yourself. You were an enemy of God. But now we've been washed, sanctified, and justified. See, that's, that's a big change. It, washed, sanctified, and justified. That's not, that's not a small word. The point what I'm getting at is I am what I am by the grace of God, right? I am. Like, this is not something I take credit for. I didn't like I, anything, any change that's taken place in me, I thank God for. God's grace has produced that. And I know he's produced it in you too, and I, you could see that as well. God gets the credit for what you are in Christ Jesus. Now, there's also this process of sanctification. Like, I'm different. I'm changed. But yet not total. I have things being grown inside of me, put inside me daily. But I also have things being pulled out of me, uprooted out of me daily as well. As that great return of Christ approaches, I'm becoming less and less like the world, and I'm becoming more and more fit to live for eternity in the presence of God. Like, as, as my life nears, like whatever the time is in my life in this world, that change is being made. More like God, less like the world. Closer to God, farther away from the world. It's, a, it's good when you can see the progress in that, right? You will see how the Holy Spirit plays a role in the process of sanctification, but, but how was I set apart? get into our passage here this blood of Christ being a means of sanctification why was I set apart like what cleansed me why is the Holy Spirit dwelling in me this is where we get to this means of sanctification it's the blood of Jesus Christ in our main passage the blood of Jesus is said to be what sanctified us that's what it says the blood of the covenant were with which he was sanctified a major point made is that we're sanctified in this chapter, this 10th chapter of Hebrews, is that we're sanctified by the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Now, what does that mean? In what sense are we sanctified by the blood of Jesus? What happened as the result of Jesus dying? Now, for one, because Jesus died for our sins, we can be forgiven of our sin if we confess it. I praise God for that provision. I can be forgiven of my sin. Because Jesus died. Because Jesus died for the sin of the world, we can be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Amen. Because Jesus died, the power of sin has been broken over those who believe. Free, free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Because Jesus died, the righteousness of God is not compromised. It's right and just for God to save men. He doesn't have to contradict himself to do that, right? Because Jesus died. This is true. The human race continues. Because Jesus died, God can not only just forgive a man's sin, but he can change the inward parts of men, casting out hearts of stone and giving them hearts of flesh. Because, of Jesus, because Jesus died, putting a new spirit in them, writing his law on their inward parts causing them to be born again because Jesus died. We are indeed set apart from the rest of the world. You mind that? You know, you look over that. We are indeed a different people. In a world filled with guilt, God's people stand out forgiven. In a world filled with wickedness, God's people stand out righteous. In a world full of rebellion, God's people stand out as Faithful, good and faithful. They stand out in that sense. This is all the result of sanctification. But as far as this expression in our main passage is concerned, what is our conclusion? There is a sense of being made separate, you know, cleansed, continual process. But the meaning here, I believe, in regards to our sanctification in the blood of Jesus, 
is that whatever there is in our hearts and being, that is holy, and whatever influences are brought upon us to make us holy are all traced back to the fact that Jesus was obedient unto death and tasted death for every man. That is what brought all of this to pass. If it were not for Jesus, there would be no forgiveness. You understand that? There would be no forgiveness if it were not for Jesus. There would be no justification. There would be no sanctification. There would be no separation, at least one that God truly honored. There would be no recreation, no glorification, had it not been for Jesus Christ. So the blood of the covenant that has sanctified us is what has made salvation available to us in the first place. The blood that was shed is why we have been changed and why we live today. All holiness, godliness, acceptance is traced back to the cross. But that's where we get to this warning. How much sore punishment? It certainly is a stern warning. It's concerning the things so dangerous that getting mercilessly stoned to death under the law of Moses is a far lighter sentence in comparison. Like that sounds good next to this. Strange as that may sound, that's the truth. <laughs> uh, this is, that's a far lesser evil than what this passage is talking about. A thing that brings sore punishment. Then the punishment is executed under the law, you understand, which were pretty severe. <laughs> pretty severe. The thing in reference is counting that the blood that sanctified you an unholy thing. Now, this is a hard passage for me to speak on. And I don't mean that in a way you might think. A passage is not hard to understand. That's not what I mean. You take 100 casual readers and have them read this passage, I think 99 out of 100 will easily read this and probably conclude the same thing. So I'm not, that's not what I mean when I say hard passage. And the people I'm ministering to right now, they're not divided, split by like sectarian views. So I'm not like having to com combat theological viewpoints. I'm not getting into that. So I don't mean hard in that sense either. I mean hard in the sense that the condition spoken up here is one of great tragedy. It, I mean, is it joyful to consider a believer falling from grace? I mean, come on, be honest. Does that bring joy to your heart to read that? It doesn't. It is a, it's a very troubling condition. But as difficult as it is to ponder on such a dreadful thought, we must know of that condition so that we might not fall into it. So it's a mercy that God's even making this known to us, right? It's a, it's a mercy. You can count it as a mercy you know about it. And we don't have to live in ignorance of this. But for the sake of grasping the passage's meaning... I will share what's being said in these surrounding verses, like 26 through 31 are pretty well like the thought being ministered to here. And what I'm, like, what I'm going to do here is just kind of like show this is like the things I'm about to say are like the result, like what results in counting that blood common or unholy. The thing being written here is not being said to unbelievers who were never converted. They're not. This is said to the same people, the same people now in this chapter, the same people who are told, hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering. Same people are told this right now in our passage. The same people who are told to draw nigh with a true heart. The same people who are told to provoke one another, love and good works. The same people who are told to not forsake the assembling of themselves together. Hint, hint, it's talking about us. It's written to us. Now in verse 26 is where this thought begins. Like following, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Like right after that, he says, for, there's a word for warning here. If we sin willfully, after receiving a knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That's what starts this whole like thread of thought here that we're talking about. Again, this is said to the same we as the previous verses. So like I said, let's not look at this as like, well, that's not us. <laughs> it's for us. <laughs> the things being spoken here are preceded by ex exhortations to hold fast, provoke, not forsake. So we should conclude that the things referenced here could be the result of not heeding to the previous exhortations. Like if you neglect to do these things, you neglect to hold fast to the profession of your faith, like, well, things aren't going to look good for you here. You want to be, that, there's, there's that stress. He's trying to prevent this from happening. That's why those exhortations are there. He gives us means to prevent it from happening. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sinning willfully. Now that's by no means referring to just being taken in a fall. We're not talking about giving in to temptation just one moment in time. It's, it's bigger than that. 
not the kind of thing you can just bounce back from. That's not what sin willfully is. To sin willfully is to choose a life of sin over Christ. It's deliberate. Voluntarily sinning as opposed to sinning due to ignorance or like due to a moment of weakness. So, I mean, like, let's see that difference here. When we say sin willfully, we're not talking like someone was in a moment of weakness and caught up in a fault. No, we're talking about a deliberate departure. It's dangerous. It's not committing a sin against God, but a full renouncement of his grace and a total departure from the faith, what some of us refer to as apostasy. You see, this is similar to the strong word delivered in Hebrews 6 regarding those who have been once enlightened. It says, taste of the good word of God, the powers of the world to come. We're talking here about falling away, which I must admit, this is a heavily misused phrase in the Christian world, fall away. I mean, people will say things like that. Well, there was a time which I fell away, which I, which I respond, oh, I hope not. Oh, I hope not. I mean, if you look at what the Bible says, I hope that's not the case. You see, falling away is often generally thought of as like just backsliding, but that's not what the scripture means when it says fall away. It means something much worse. In scripture, falling away means a person has gone beyond the boundaries of recovery. That's what fall away means. Backsliding is backing up towards the cliff. That's what backsliding is. You wanted to make a difference between the two in your own mind. Backsliding is like backing up towards the cliff. Falling away is falling off the cliff to your death. It's troubling. It's a point where a person is forever cut off. The term only applies to people who used to believe, too. You notice that. <laughs> Non-converts don't fall away. No. It's not, that's not the case. We're talking about people who were in, on the inside. That's who this warning is given to. If a person experiences life in Christ and then falls away in the sense that I just mentioned, falls away, then that person can never be renewed again to repentance, it says. That is, it's impossible for that person to be turned. That's what repentance is. It's a complete turnaround. Reverse. To go that way and go opposite. It's impossible to renew them. That is, turn them back. They're locked. You can't turn them back. That person can never be saved again. Now, do we know who, who is in a state like that? No. And no one should make any pursuit to find out who such people are. We're given no revelation as to how to identify this state. We're not. So let's, let's, be, let's, you know, we're on, let's be careful here when we say this. We're not giving anyone a license to cut off or to be presumptuous of their brethren or even themselves. I thank God that this knowledge is hidden. I really do. If you could, Leo, if you really could know a person was beyond recovery, how would you live with that knowledge? So I would say it's, it's a great mercy God's hidden that. God has shown us mercy. And with that being the case, we should never assume someone's in that state, right? We never assume that. I mean, imagine if someone thought you were in that state, right, before you were in Christ. Imagine if someone assumed that and cut you up. Well, <laughs> yeah, you see how damaging that could be if you're presumptuous on this thing. As far as we're concerned, anyone we come in contact with can repent. That's my mindset. That's what I'm going to take. Like as Paul said, we're persuaded of better things concerning you. I mean, he, he gave that passage to Hebrews 6. It's impossible, he said, but we're persuaded of better things concerning you. He didn't take that view. He didn't say, you're in this state. He warned him about it. And he made provision for the brethren to confirm they're not in that state. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, war the warning's not given for the sake of, like, looking at other people. It's so you won't fall into that state. That's what he's doing here. I mean, that's, that's the mercy. He's making known the state for your sake, for your safety. To be aware of what's out there. To be aware of a state out there. And by making it known to us, we can avoid that. Praise the Lord. We can avoid that. Amen. So we're not talking about, to reiterate, we're not talking about like a sheep wandering away from the fold. If Jesus bringing it back, we're talking about gone for good. As opposed to other things written about sin. Now some in the church, now this is a device of Satan. It really is. There's some in the church that can be deceived into thinking that this can't happen. And that Paul's speaking mere hypothetical terms of an impossible scenario, right? But, brethren, you know, well, the tone of the passage leaves no such impression. It really doesn't. It makes no sense for such an idea to even be inserted. After exhorting the brethren to continue in doing well, Paul's going to follow up these exhortations by hypothesizing about something that can't happen? See, it's a very, it's unfitting. It doesn't fit. It would be almost inappropriate if that's what he was doing. 
It, it, that's not a good way to back up what he just exhorted us to do, you see. So you've got to be able to piece that together. I mean, like, put away, like, the theological sectarian garbage and just look at the passage to see what is he trying to tell us here. What is it? You see, such a thought like that, that doesn't provoke someone to raise their guard up. You see, we don't want to do that. When we speak to the saints, we don't want to speak in a way where they're going to lower their guard, you know, like take the armor off, put down the shield, put down the sword, put down the helmet, thinking, well, I'm okay. That's what <laughs> sounds like something from the devil, isn't it? Let's get, you, you, could, you could spare, that looks like a heavy shield, right? That looks real heavy. Why don't you, why don't you just set it down right here? Set down that shield of faith. You're going to get bombarded with darts, right? So we don't want to give heed to these kind of mindsets. This is being mentioned because there's a real danger of something like this happen, happening once a knowledge of the truth is received. Now I'll add, the knowledge of the truth, that doesn't simply refer to academic knowledge, right? It's not talking about intellectual knowledge. If we you see the scripture, it doesn't say, if we sin willfully after reading the Bible. That's not what he said. If we sin willfully after just being told about Christ or after being preached to, no, it's very specific here. If we sin willfully after receiving a knowledge of the truth, this is the same as being enlightened. Enlightenment, that's what's in reference here. It's, understand, it's receiving understanding from the Lord after receiving understanding from God. Now see, we know the Son of God has come and given us an understanding. That's what the scriptures say. We know the Son of God's come, he's given, he's given, he's given us an understanding. That's what's in reference here. It is having your eyes open to the truth by the Lord through the gospel. Like I said, the eyes of your heart being enlightened, that's what's being talked about here. We're talking like after this is experienced. So this is by no means the casual listener. This is someone who has had the real thing revealed and taken hold of those things at one time. But as the scriptures declare after this, there's no more sacrifice for sins if we sin willfully. Now what does that mean? This brings us back to what the scriptures affirmed earlier. God has provided salvation through Jesus. There is no one else who can save you. If you reject the provision God made through Christ, there's no way for you to be saved. Right? By utterly and completely rejecting Jesus, you've thrown away the one way for God to accept you and save you. Now, if you were to get some scenarios here, what would it be like? A man, like in the case of what do you expect to happen here? If a man with a life-threatening disease is given a cure that can heal him of that thing that's going to kill him, and he takes that cure and he pours it down the drain, what do you think is going to happen as a result of him doing that? Or a man, he's stranded on an island. He's almost out of resources. He's going to die. And he finally sees a ship coming by. What's going to happen if he sits back and decides not to wave that ship down? What's going to happen, Right? What's our inevitable conclusion? The man's stuck at the bottom of a deep hole and a rope's lowered down to him. What's going to happen if he cuts the rope? Likewise, if a person throws Christ away, what do you expect to happen? The following part will tell us what awaits such people. It says, this is in verse 27, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour of adversaries. Now that's what's going to happen if you take Jesus out of the picture. You move Jesus from your life, okay, that's what, this is what you're left with, right? This is, this, is, this is all you got left. This is what you have to look forward to. Now what's indignation? Indignation, well, look at the meaning, it's pretty strong. It means anger or extreme anger mingled with contempt, disgust, or abhorrence. And you think, God being extremely angry, all right? That's different than like me, extremely angry. God, extreme anger, that's scary, brethren. Fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, of consuming fire, right? See, God is love, right? And God's consuming fire. Well, which one? He, <laughs> you don't want to see the consuming fire God coming at you, right? So when Christ has been removed from the picture, a person only has fiery, terrifying, and consuming anger of the Lord to look forward to. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God and have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, punishing them with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. 
It is an anger so terrifying and frightening. Men are going to call for rocks and hills to fall on them. That's how terrifying this is. This is what they had to look forward to, calling down rocks on themselves, right? It's, 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 a ter- it's a terrible thing to consider. Such people will stand before the Lord in judgment, perhaps after having done what they perceive to be great works. Like, well, look at what we did. Look at what we did, God. Not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, right? Not all who say, Lord, Lord. I cast out demons. I, I did all these mighty, wonderful works in your name. I never knew you. I don't know you. That's what you hear if Jesus isn't with you. I don't know you. Depart, worker of iniquity. Of course, none of these things bring a smile to your face when hearing it. Like, it better not, right? It better not. It better not take joy in hearing something like this. These are things that are intended to consider. These are things we need to consider when tempted to sin and forsake our Lord. Really, that's what it comes down to. What are we putting ourselves into when tempted to do that? Like, let's put it in perspective. On top of these things already listed, of the coming judgment of those who renounce Christ, we have yet another thing to consider. No place to call home, right? Hell. The lake of fire is where such people will go, but this place is not prepared for men to inhabit originally. Rather, it's everlasting fire. This is the words of Jesus. Everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It's the words of Christ, though. So eternity without, it's eternity without God in a place that you really have no place in. Everything you desire in hell will never be fulfilled. Everything you could possibly want, it'll never be available to you. That's life in hell. You see, hell isn't like a playroom for the wicked. People, they talk like it's this way. People say, well, I'd rather be in hell with my friends. They see, they're looking at like, you go to some, like a dentist's office or doctor's office, and hell's like that little playroom that the wicked go into. That's not what it is. Meaning of life in hell is non-existent. You will live for all eternity being utterly useless. And this, of course, is in addition to being tormented with fire forever and ever, right? The worst part of this is that if a person does renounce the Lord Jesus, they really have no idea what they've gotten themselves into. This light comes when it's too late. (laughs) Terrible thing. You know, this is just my opinion. And I'm not going to bind this, but it's something to consider. I don't think a person's life in this world even lasts much longer if they do, in fact, fall into this state of apostasy. I really don't. With no chance of ever being saved again, I can't see the Lord keeping them in the earth decades and decades and decades and decades longer once that, size, that, that tie is severed. Now, like I said, I'm not going to bind that, but it's something to think about. Once the door is closed, like, what reason is it for you to be here? Just something to think about. <laughs> Should we, like, venture out, you know? Let's, let's consider that. Now, when, what leads to a person choosing to live in sin rather than stay in Christ? Like all these things we've gone over, what causes that? This is where I center more on this passage that's been given to me in Hebrews. For a person to utterly renounce Christ, they have to count the blood that sanctified them an unholy thing. I believe this has to occur in order for a person to fall away. This has to happen. This is the thing that leads to everything that I've been saying on the subject so far. Now this passage is very sobering and startling on many levels. So what exactly does it mean to count the blood of Christ unholy? What, what in the world does that mean, you know? Of any other versions, they're, kinda, they're pretty dead on the way they render this. They, use, they substitute the word unholy for the following words. They say common, or they say profane, ordinary. The blood of Jesus, ordinary. Or this one says it this way, no different than other men's blood. Troubling. But as far as counting unholy is concerned, it fits well. It fits well with that word common, and that is like what I perceive to be the meaning here. When something's when God made something holy, he set it apart from everything else and devoted that thing to sacred uses. What was unholy were the things that were not set apart and they were commonly used by everybody. There's nothing unique about it. So to count the blood of Christ as common would be like a denial of its power. Treating the blood as if it was the same as the blood that poured from any man. Ineffective. It's a declaration that there is nothing unique about the blood and that it really didn't do anything at all. To renounce the Lord Jesus would require someone to treat him as though he were just another man. Not the son of God. 
not the word made flesh, not the Lamb of God offered without blemish and without spot, not the Savior of humanity. To count the blood as uncommon would be calling it ineffective and useless. To be more precise, this is treating the blood of Jesus with contempt. It is departing from the provision with a bitter heart and malice toward the Lord Jesus and treating it what he did as if it was nothing to you. That's really what it is. Hence, the, wor the World English Bible translates this part of the text to say, that person was made holy by the blood of the new agreement and then calls it nothing. He captured the meaning. In the Message Bible commentary, as I call it, that's what it should be called if you quote from it, it did manage to capture the right spirit of the text when it rendered it to say, spits on the sacrifice that made him whole. Contempt, that's what he was trying to bring out there, contempt. The rest of the passage does bring this meaning to light, that that's what he's talking about here. He said, people who count the blood of blood that's unholy, that they have trodden the Son of God underfoot. And that's a startling, I'm going to show you what other versions put this to show like how strong of a statement that is. The other versions say this, turns against the Son of God. Like in the set of trodden underfoot, turns against the Son of God. That sounds like a certain apostle, doesn't it? No, that, yeah, that instantly you're thinking of a certain person when you read that. Or turns their backs on the Son of God, spurned the Son of God. Now, spurn, it means to kick off, like to shake off for the sake of, for the purpose of it getting away from you. Spurned the Son of God, trampled the Son of God, walks on and hates the Son of God, who has contempt for the Son of God and poured out scorn on the Son of God. See, that's a much stronger statement than people might think. So this is no accidental thing. This is an expression of hatred toward Christ. Love waxing cold. When you depart, you don't just walk away. It's as if you run Christ over on the way out. Stomping on him in a rage as you do. Showing contempt. Not only this, but spite has been done to the Holy Ghost as well. Been grieved, rejected, insulted. Now having gone over those things, I think it's pretty clear. This has to be apostasy. How could someone do that and come back? An utter departure from Christ as opposed to backsliding or being tripped up. Who knows how long it will take for a man to fall into this state, but I'm not going to find out. I encourage you to do the same. Don't experiment in this area. <laughs> I assure you that if you keep pushing Christ away, your heart will eventually become so hard and so callous that you'll snuff out any love that was there, which results in this contempt and hatred toward him. But what can we see in all this? After going through all these intense, these gritty things, I can see the inevitable conclusion. If you join yourself to Jesus Christ and then abandon him completely, you forfeit the life that you have through him. Jesus said that if you believe in him, you have everlasting life, hath everlasting life, but if you leave, that life goes with him. I believe that's what's being said here. Men should never expect Jesus to keep blessing them if they've rejected him and treated him with disdain. They shouldn't not well in their act of doing that. They should not be treated as though they're being blessed. God certainly won't overlook this. I mean, if this is God's beloved son, like your salvation depends on what you think of this man. It really does. Will God do nothing if his son is rejected after you've had fellowship with him? Look at what happened. Like, well, we brought up Judas earlier. Look at what happened to Judas. Let's bring him to the stand to testify of this. At the time, all that time with Jesus... All that time working with him, eating with him, walking with him, hearing his teaching, working miracles by his power, healing, casting out demons. He did this with the other 12 by the finger of God. He did. Did all these things in his name. And after all of that, after all that, he throws Jesus away for 30 pieces of silver. I don't know how much that's worth today, and I'm sure you're going to have a nightmare if you try to figure it out. They've figured as low as 600 to 15,000, but regardless, it's pretty weak in comparison to what Jesus can give. I don't care if it's 15 billion. That's nothing compared to what Jesus can give. Well, we do know this much. It, it could buy a field. It could, it could buy a field. We, we know that it was worth that much, at least. A field that, that was spilled with had blood on it, right? like cursed ground. 
But let's look at, that's what it bought. Let's look at what that 30 pieces of silver didn't buy Judas. 30 pieces of silver didn't buy Judas eternal life. 30 pieces of silver didn't buy Judas a new heart or a new spirit. 30 pieces of silver didn't buy Judas pure garments of white. 30 pieces of silver didn't buy Judas a mansion in glory. Is this worth the cost, brethren? That's what I'm bringing out. 30 pieces of silver didn't buy Judas a crown of righteousness. 30 pieces of silver didn't sanctify Judas. He forfeited his position in Christ's ministry when he threw him away for that small amount of money, which he didn't even spend. He saw it wasn't worth the cost. I spilled innocent blood. It wasn't worth this little sack of money. He threw it back at them. He saw it wasn't worth the cost. And it was too late for him when he saw it. I mean, can't you see this? Why are we told about a condition we can't recover from? Because it teaches us that you can't just keep dabbling in the world and expect to just keep coming back. You can't. If you go sinning after the Son of God cleanses you, you don't have that guarantee that there's an open door to come back to. That's what he's telling us. People are like this. They're like Israel wanting to go back to Egypt. They've been thinking too much about these pot shirts they used to eat from. Thinking about those nice lunch breaks we had after that hard work. Gathering all that straw together. That's what they're thinking about. Well, it was hard. Oh, they were mean to us. They beat us. They drove us to the limit. But we sure had nice lunch breaks, didn't we? That's what they were wanting to go back to. Lunch breaks. Well, we have more than just nice lunch breaks in Christ Jesus, don't we? They're thinking about those good old days of slavery and abuse. They wanted to go back, and as a result of that, an entire generation had to wait till they all dropped dead before they could go into the promised land. They forfeited the promised land when they went back. Why are you told, don't go back? Look at Israel. No, Adam and Eve, you can't just walk up to that tree and just eat that fruit and expect free access to the garden. No, you can't just come back. Did they go back to the garden? Was there maybe like something I missed here? Did they ever go back to that garden? Did anyone go in that garden after that? No, they forfeited rights to the access of the tree of life in that garden when they ate that forbidden fruit. Forfeited it. And the enemy's going to try to get you to leave Christ too. Yeah, he drew them away. He drew, he got Adam and Eve. He got Israel. He got Judas. He's going to go for you too. He wants to add you to the list of testimonies, add you to the list of failures, add you to the list of people who couldn't make it, who sold it for just a, like, like in the case of Esau, sold his birthright for a little pot of porridge. That's what, that resembles everyone who forsakes, for, who forsakes Christ. You're forsaken him for something so small and insignificant, it won't even sustain you a day. You'll be sorry. You'll be sorry if you do. He's going to try to get you to put your affection elsewhere, minimize, lessen that love for Christ. He wants you to regard Christ as nobody. He can't give you what you need. That's what he wants you to think, and that's where love will flee. So what do we say of this? Shall we leave the Lord Jesus? Shall we just pull the plug on salvation? No! Now I have to read these things. Some people might ask. You've heard this question in Scripture. Who then can be saved, Right? with so much against us. And there's this possibility that if we do heed and draw back far enough, we're gone forever, who then could be saved, some might think. But praise the Lord, there is grace and provision to keep this from ever happening to you. There are going to be a people who deviate and fall away. There are. But I believe there's going to be many more who don't. There are going to be people who stand at the day of judgment on the right side, the correct side, the Christ. And Christ is going to turn them and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You fulfilled the task. That's be said of you. He'll turn to them. He said, the devil tried to take them, but he couldn't. They stayed by my side. They didn't forsake my ways. That could be you. Amen. Jesus said, if you confess his name before men, he will confess your name before the Father. I want to be confessed before the Father. Don't you want that? You see, a desire like that, that'll drive you away from the enemy. That'll keep you from leaving. 
Jesus made promises of those who overcome. You'll eat of the tree of life. Him who overcomes, he'll eat of the tree of life. He'll not be hurt by the second death. He'll eat of the hidden manna, a stone with a new name written on it, power over the nations, white raiment, be made a pillar in the temple of God and sit with him in his throne. You really, anyone going to dare think that none of those promises are going to be fulfilled? They're going to be fulfilled. Amen. Question is, am I in that number? And I say, you can be in that number. You can stay in that number. Stay in the number. It is the truth. Believe. What was said in this main passage doesn't ever have to be said of you. And it won't be said of you if you continue in the faith grounded and settled. You can read that. This was ministered to me last night. There are evidences in this passage to confirm you're not in that state. He who was once enlightened, he can't be restored after being once enlightened. Well, are you enlightened still? There's your evidence. Made partakers of the Holy Ghost? Can that still be said? Well, there's evidence you're still in. Tasted of the word of God and the powers of the world to come? Well, if you're still there, there's your evidence. You're not in that state. Do you think Jesus' blood is common? I'll tell you, no minister stood up here and reflected that idea. I guarantee everyone who stood up in this pulpit is sanctified. Because it's true. It won't ever be said of you if you make your call and election sure. Isn't that the words of Scripture? If you do these things, you'll never fall. I believe it. Never fall. I'm for never falling. He, he talked too much about falling away. How about not falling? How about that? How about never fall? How about that? We believe you can fall away. Okay, keep going. What else? How can I prevent that, right? Like, well, hey, if I can, like, tell me how did I get that? I'm not, like, wanting that when someone talks about it. Tell me more. The blood of Jesus, it's not uncommon. It's not unholy. It cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus is why God can look at me right now. And he likes what he sees, right? The blood of Jesus brought me from this world, and he made me his. That's why I belong to Christ. The blood of Jesus is why I come before God, and I'm not an alien. I'm not a stranger, an oddball. God sees child, born of God. That's what he sees. The blood of Jesus is unique. It really is, brother. It has done far more than the blood of an ordinary man. No other blood can do what it does. Don't throw Jesus away, brethren. Now, the only way this can happen is if you listen to the enemy. It really comes down to that. Satan got Peter to deny Christ three times. Got him to do it. And every day, he's going to try to get you to do the same thing. And he's going for a lot more than three. A lot more than three. He's looking for a lifetime of that. In this case, a total denial. That's what it, Satan's not enough... He's not, he's, not, he's not content with a denial in the sense where a person can just look at Christ and come back. See, that wasn't enough for him. He would have rather that would have been Peter's end. He would have wanted it to be over for him. He wants it to be over for you. He tries to fill your mind with doubt and uncertainty. And if he can get you to doubt Christ, you will turn your back on him. There will be constant attempts to get you to choose the pleasures of this world over the world to come. Your whole life. There'll be attempts to get you to choose someone over Christ, whether it's a friend, whether it's your own flesh and blood child, your parents, your siblings, your spouses. There'll be choices this way throughout your life. There will be attempts to shipwreck your faith. But in all of the attempts made thus far, have you fallen? You've endured a lot, brethren, up to this point. He can keep you to the end. And he will if you stay with him. Are we not still standing today, right now? It's because of God's grace that we are. He's, he kept you standing till now, and he can keep you believing until you're on your deathbed. You'll leave this world. Should the Lord tarry, you can leave this world with a devil being a failure. Now they talk about heaven. Oh, we lost another one, but Satan's going to say that a lot. Isn't he? Another failed attempt. The other one made it to glory. The other one held fast to the faith. You see, the devil has, in a sense, given himself a taste of hell in this world. Because if it's an unfulfilled desire, one will, the total overthrow of Christ's church. That's not going to happen. 
He wants it to happen, but he will leave this world never being able to fulfill that task and spend the rest of eternity knowing that fact. Never could overthrow it. So he's given himself a taste of hell in that. But when you wander away from Christ, this is when you're at risk. That's when the devil can drag you away. If you let him get close enough, that is. And if he gets too close, you'll find yourself giving Christ away for a cheap cost. Determine yourselves and put your armor on. Keep fighting, brethren. Fight the good fight of faith. It's not a losing fight. He that endures to the end is saved. So I'll close also with a word concerning this. What about those who have backslidden? Because although there is a condition that exists when a person can't be saved, I don't want to ever ever leave the impression that we should give up on a person and assume that they can't be reached. I won't do that. I won't settle for that. If I've said anything to lead that, I'm going to correct that right now. Seeing there is a line that can be crossed where recovery is impossible, I would think that would make us all the more diligent to labor for those who have wandered away, wouldn't you? The scriptures not say that if a man sin a sin that's not unto death, that life can be restored if a brother pray for him, right? That's in the scripture, Lyle. Like, I'm talking about someone who slept, who slept, he's wandered away. Someone can restore him. Did Jesus not bring back that sheep that wandered away from the 90 and 9? He brought it back, didn't he? He did. So, like, let's, yeah, let's, let's consider this. Jesus can stop a person from getting to this point. He really can. I'm talking, like, in regards to people you may have a burden for. Jesus can stop this. He stopped it with you. He didn't let you go that far. Now, no matter how deep in sin those you care about may be, you don't know how deep it is. And hence, you can never assume they can't be recovered. Your prayers could be what stops a person from falling into that state. Consider that. Consider the power of prayer. That could stop this. It did with that man who didn't sin the sin unto death. It stopped, it stopped him, didn't it? Or the one who was taken in a fault. Hey, it stopped him. It stopped Peter. I prayed for you, Peter, right? I prayed for you, Peter. It stopped, it stopped Aaron. Anyway, he's un, under old covenant. But that golden calf wasn't overlooked. Moses said, well, I prayed for you that, that same hour, that very time. At that moment, I prayed for you, Aaron. That's why you're alive right now. So let's not give up. Let's not assume that's something only God knows. We're not going to take it upon ourselves to label such people like, why would you even settle for that in the first place? Think of it this way. If you had a mother with a child that was born, and that child had terrible breathing, they had to constantly come into the emergency room and pump air into this child. And they came to her and handed her a waiver. And they tell her, you know, this is going to be a lot of work keeping this child alive. So if you would like, next time he stops breathing, we can just let him die in peace so he doesn't have to live a life of suffering. Just sign the name here, and next time he loses breath, we'll just leave him alone. What do you suppose that mother's going to say? Keep him alive! Because that mother, I guarantee, would rather her child die knowing she did everything she could to save his life than to have him leave this world while she sat by and did nothing. That's my aspect of prayer. If a person falls into that state, it's not because I was slack. It's not because I did nothing or I had no heart. Give yourself that satisfaction too. I did, I, I'm doing everything I can. That's, that's my mindset too. Last thing we want to do is ignore those who have been led astray. So in closing, brethren, I urge you, don't take what you have for granted. I think that's really what it comes down to. Don't take this connection to Christ, what you have in Christ, Christ himself. Don't take him for granted. I can't imagine the heartbreak and the weariness I would feel if any of you left the faith. I mean, think about it. What if you did hear Brother Al forsook? Well, he hasn't. He's still here. All of you are still here. I'd like to keep that. I'd like to keep it that way. And God does keep things that way. Let's keep each other in prayer so that the Lord will keep us safe from the enemy. Let's... I mean, I, I'm really exerted. I'm not talking about like in one, just one moment. I'm talking about let's just, let's just determine ourselves. We're going to remember each other in prayer. 
because we're mindful all of us are under attack. Let's remember those who we have a heart for, those who have shown any sensitivity, those who need enlightenment. Let's remember them fervently in our prayers and not overlook this condition. Put your trust in the one that keeps men from falling. Remember, God, see, God doesn't want you lost either. I don't want to fall into that state. Well, it's not like the will of God. God's not drawing me in that direction. He's not. God's not drawing me into a pit. He's drawing me upward. So keep going upward, brethren. He has the power to keep these things from happening. So may we all continue to look to Jesus and not see him as a common man, but maintain this view that he is indeed the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Don't let your heart be hardened, brethren. Christ can help us. Mm.